What do you want to talk about first, guys? You you mentioned a phone call that you got. Oh, yeah. One night, first wife and the kids that were AAU swimmers were up at the local junior college swimming their bums off. And um, the phone was ringing in the kitchen as I was walking from my studio, which had been built at the back of the garage. And I ran into the kitchen. I said, hello. And the voice says, Mike Ryer, this is Jack Kirby. Alex Tull says you're a pretty good anchor. In less time than it takes to tell, I thought, this is somebody yanking my chain, you know. But no, <laughs> it, it was Jack, and he uh, asked me if I'd like to come out and, and pick up something to ink for him. And I said, uh, uh, okay. Like, like they say in the cheap novels, in less time than it takes to tell, I said, yeah. <laughs> so I went to his house the next day. He was down temporarily in Irvine, California. And he showed me the page, and it was that famous biography page he did for Ma Romani, where he's sitting at the board with all the characters flying off it. And I always carried my tools with me because in working with Russ Manning, I had a double set in the car. So whenever he called and said, come on out, I had everything I needed. And it was in the car. But I told Jack, I said, I'll have it back tomorrow morning. He said, oh, no, no. He says, why don't you just sit right here at my board and do it? And I thought, holy crap, is this a baptism of fire sitting at Jack's board? So I went out and I got my tools. Mark Evan Air told me later that what he was doing was finding out that the work came from my hand alone and how I worked under pressure. Yeah. I guess I passed. I guess so. <laughs> after that, a great deal of stuff Jack did in Southern California for Marvel Mania and Toys for Tots Marine uh, Christmas Drive and things of that nature and private projects, I inked for Jack. And uh, uh, apparently he was looking for someone who would ink him on the West Coast and Alex Toth recommended me. And uh, so when he left Marvel to go to DC, I knew nothing about it. I just got a phone call from Jack at LAX saying, Mike, I'm flying back to New York City. It's something really important. I can't tell you, but you're part of it. So three days later, I get a phone call from Maggie Thompson saying, Mike, what's this that Jack has left Marvel and gone to D.C.? And I went, beats me. <laughs> and I got a call from Jack and he said, uh, well, I wanted you to be part of it, but they, they just wouldn't go for it. Sorry, you know. So I continued to work on his private projects and to work with Russ Manning and, and things of that nature. And uh, it took about four completed issues of the New God series to be finished and published that uh, Jack convinced Infantino and company that he wanted me inking the books. Uh, he had been shown all the stuff that Vince was leaving out and, and not being very faithful. And of course, Jack being the conscientious guy he was, in the back of his mind, if if he convinced them to take me, he wanted to make sure that Vince would continue to get work because Jack understood the man working to support his family, et cetera. Right. And so DC acquiesced to his wishes, and I know that they were convinced that I would fail. And to their chagrin, I did not fail. And uh, that's how it all began. I actually uh, only got to work on a handful of the Jimmy Olsons. And uh, when they were having there, someone, uh, someone did, fix the Superman heads at the New York offices, I think right, I, actually, right. I actually phoned them and I said, hey, look, on, on the books that I'm inking, why don't you send me the model sheets that you're using for soups and I'll make those changes and at least... When the book is printed, it'll all be inked from the same hand. And so they said, okay. So why don't I hush up and let you ask some questions? <laughs> the answer is 42. <laughs> it always <laughs> is, right? Yeah, right now, the question is wrong. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. No problem. So the first uh, issue, if you look at the timeline here, was it's not correct compared to what you started with. You started with issue f new guys, number five, right? Yes. That was the first book when it came, the old special delivery service that the post office had 
it came, I opened the package, and two reactions. Number one, I was engulfed by the aroma of Roy Tam cigars, which was quite intoxicating. And the number two, I looked at the pages and I said to myself, do not screw this up, Mike. <laughs> and, uh, did, you, did you have that reaction every time you received like the, the next book and the next book? No, because what I did after the first couple of books is I went to the grocery store and bought a pack of Roy Tam cigars. And made the mistake of mistake of smoking them like cigarettes. <laughs> My wife came out to the studio one day and she said, "How are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm uh, not doing too bad." <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that lasted a week. <laughs> so I was no longer infatuated with Roy Tam cigars and the aroma. It was just if it was there, it was there, and that's what you know. I dealt with it. <laughs> but Jack Jack's work was so powerful, and I want to say that. I never had a problem inking Jack. It was not hard inking Jack because for some reason I had uh, an empathy for what he was doing, having grown up with the Simon Kirby comics and the work that was wholly his. The hard part of inking Jack was keeping up and three pages a day. And also since DC knew I would fail and uh, would let me take over from Coletta, they also insisted that I accept less money than he was getting per page. And of course, he was getting the least amount of money, I think, in the entire business, including Charlton comic books, who were notoriously uh, low rates. But it changed. And uh, Jack, uh, I think in the beginning, was impressed with my uh, ability to keep up and work under pressure. And then he, I think he started paying more attention to the finished books and the pages. And I think he became to really like what I was doing because I feel I was not inking Jack Kirby. I was finishing his pencil statements in ink. That, that. I say that. I, I, I say that hoping it makes sense. It, mm -hmm. that, 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 mm -hmm. That's pretty much what we're going to see uh, as we start wandering through some artwork here. Well, those, um, early, those early books, I don't know what you want to show, but I, I think that Jack, well, the people who love Jack's work, there, there are those who say things that, but they just didn't like his writing when he left Marvel. And my feeling is that if you love Jack's work, his words is pure Jack. Yeah. And I think what Jack was doing, uh, he was creating these incredible visuals and told these wonderful stories. And then he wrote dialogue as if he was doing the, the libretto for an opera. I think yeah. his books were operatic. Um, do you have a question or something you want to show? Yep. So these are the New God stories that you inked. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven stories. Did, did, did I? I must have inked a background there then. Obviously. You did. You inked it. Oh, then, yeah. All, all, all the boulders and things. Yeah. Which, yeah they, uh, perhaps they whited they it all out. You know, I'm always an advocate of, of white spaces. Used it a lot in, in, in inking his interior art. And perhaps right. they felt for the cover, this would be more dramatic. I feel that the rock should be there because it, it's part of the visual storytelling of where this fight is going on. It kind of makes those two rocks they left on there a little like, what is <laughs> like this? Floating in space. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, where did he get the rocks in his left hand, you know, yeah. left arm? Yeah. And yeah. Well, I guess. Oh, there we go. Jack. Jack. I think of all the cartoonist work I've ever seen that draw water, the two best artists are Jack Kirby and Bern Hogarth. Mm. Two exponents of dynamics. Mm -hmm. To me, that stuff is so alive. Yeah. And uh, I like to think that I did a good job finishing his his statement. Fifty years later, I guess I can say anything I want, and nobody's going to get mad at me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> What's up next? 
<laughs> so, so, so the new gods on the right hand side. That's this is that's what's the name of the story again? This is the um, glory boat. Glory no. boat. Yeah, it's glory boat. You did all the titling. So, not many people know that you lettered, you titled stuff from scratch. Oh yeah, um, I did all the. Well, um, on these early pages, Jack, of course, uh, Greek might be the wrong word, but he. He greeted in or loosely penciled on the art like itself that. his dialogue. Yeah. And the first couple of books, he indicated on the border the sound effect he wanted. And I think that I probably didn't exactly put it exactly where he would have, which doesn't mean that I did it wrong. But right. after the first couple of issues, he went ahead and indicated across the art where he wanted his uh, bangs, as we used to call them. But, yeah, uh, and, and you can see on this... Uh, Splash page for New Gods, the uh, borders that I've left off. Oh. Not a lot, but the top and, and, and right side there. Yep. And at the bottom for the credits. Um, and even there at the bottom where the water is. Yeah. Well, um, Anthony Tolan told me something that someone told him when he was uh, coloring for DC and Marvel. Someone one of his mentors said that white is a color that will never be out of register. <laughs> it's true. It's and funny. I think it's such a powerful color. Yeah. Yep. You might have well, to. it's fun seeing this stuff black and white after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> I look at this and I go, boy, I wish I had that ability now. Mm-hmm. I, I blame it on the paper and the inks and the, and the pens and the brushes are not what they used to be. This is um, the page here on the right in pencil. That uh, appears to be probably one of the most famous beloved issues. Yes. That's the pack, the pack. correct? Yes, right. And, uh, and there, oops, there, there, is, there you see some more of my no borders. Yeah, it's great. That uh, that that cover is interesting because someone commissioned me once to do that cover with no lettering on it to create a background where the lettering would be, and of course where that blurb box was. And I have to tell you, trying to figure out what Jack would have drawn um, is not an easy thing. What he did came so naturally to him. Uh, an evolution from his very beginnings of drawing and understanding anatomy and so on, and then turning it into just raw power. And uh, question. That's one of the typefaces I used a lot. Mm. Yep. As I look at this page and that's only two thirds of a day's work. <laughs> oh, there we go, the bug. Yep, the bug. I like the sidebar he put on the cover there. With Light Ray and Orion. Um, it's just a little bit different at the time, and it looks good. Hmm. That's some more of my uh, Philippine-inspired lettering there, the bug. I don't know, when they, when they redid the Sunny Sumo cover and added all that black with the halo around Sunny. Um, I don't think it's any more effective than if they had just done some really great color. So did I actually, I actually added all that background yeah. beneath and, and, and behind the character? Well, what book is this from? Can you um, tell them? It, oh. It's Forever People number seven. Oh, Forever People. Well, uh, I guess this is a good example of some of what I did do for Jack. Right. Um, I loved inking Dark Side. And <laughs> uh, when we get way ahead to Hunger Dogs, Jack had done that so fast, I made sure as best I could that his forehead piece there was the same size on all the pages because it varied. Uh, Jack was an impressionist, almost um, 
eventually he became an expressionist. And the people that are upset by some of the things he did in the fourth world books just don't understand that if an artist is worth his salt, um, he will evolve. Um, look at any of the great guys that are admired and look at their early stuff, their mid stuff and their later stuff. And it may be recognizable as their style, but they have all evolved, brought different things to their work. And Jack, I, I think this whole fourth world period for Jack was a real period of evolution for him. Um, he was let loose for a while, but unfortunately there was a long lead on that leash and for God only knows what reasons he was reined in. Yeah. You don't rein in genius, <laughs> you know? What have we got next to look at? This is again issue seven of Forever People. And then Forever People ended up bringing in Dead Man at the end. I, I'm sure that Jack was encouraged to bring Dead Man into the book uh, because publishers and editorial department seem to want to <clears throat> instruct. They can't leave well enough alone. And although that uh, as Jack's anchor and letterer, <clears throat> I did enjoy inking that book because it did have Dead Men in it, which was a character that I kind of liked at DC. So I realized that Jack was probably not incredibly happy about that. Boy, that's a nice explosive cover. Go back yeah. to the pencils. Go back to the pencils. Can you go can you go right back to the pencils on that? I just did. Well, now you can show the inks. <sighs> uh, if it's possible. Yeah. There's the inks. I think this is to me excellent proof for the naysayers who say all I did was just trace his pencil. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, how come I trace so much stuff that weren't wasn't there? <laughs> oh, well. well, especially the the dark side uh, splash. You you created the whole background, the environment, and everything. Ah, oh, his great double page spreads. Yeah. And and here you put a really dark border. And you've talked to me in the past about dark borders and why you did well, it. Well, to me, to me, to me, it was a form of emphasis. And of course, I picked it up from one of the great, great adventure artists in American comic strips, Roy Crane, who oh. created who created Wash Tubs and Captain Easy and and later Buzz Sawyer. And he, in this daily strip, would periodically, if, if he wanted emphasis on a story, would give it a big border like that. And so I just, remembering all the things that I admired of from the artists who inspired me, uh, became part of how I did things. Um, that and the, and, and the borderless pages left open for color, I was influenced by I think the best colored comic books of all time, and that's the handful of Flash Gordon comics that Al Williamson did way back in the mid 1960s. Oh wow! Huh. And I believe his late wife Arlene did the color work, and they're just loaded with white and borderless panels, mm -hmm. and it makes the pages poster-like. It might show up in some later work, but if you'll find a page where there is no border around the text narrative at the top of the panel, and if you look closely the top of the lettering forms the border. Roy right. Crane would do that if he had lots of copy and instead of bordering the panel, he would just put the lettering up there. Uh, and sometimes Jack would have more than I felt comfortable in, you know, infringing upon the power of the artwork. So whenever it made sense, that's what I did. Um, but it all goes back to all the people that influenced me. And, you know, 
Russ and Jack were both master storytellers, and I learned so much from both of them. And um, the people that I grew up finding old Sunday pages in my grandmother's attic, of Flash Gordon and, and, and Captain Easy and, 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 oh God, some of the stuff by King's Gasoline Alley, that those, those pages were friggin' fine art, you know. Yeah. Mr. Miracle. Those were fun. And of course, I didn't get to start until number five. And um, I had been studying Bill Drought or someone at DC, and I loved the way they rendered their women. So on the splash page and another page with a large panel, I prettied up Barta's face a little bit. Michael, uh, I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have, but... Um, and Jack called me and he basically said, don't ever change the faces. And he was absolutely correct in pointing it out to me. Fortunately, he never noticed that I would sometimes thin her waist and her ankles. <laughs> so, so Mike, this is the hmm? cover to number, this is the cover to number five. And if you look at it, this is what was actually printed. See how they changed it? They, um, they made everything. They made it much more explosive. Flamethrowers, and they had a label of flamethrower. But they have totally you got have it. you got the finish? Have you got the final cover there? Just to put next. Okay, that is that is the final cover on the right. Okay, now what's interesting um, are some of these changes that Jack. Now, okay, the A bomb. That's not Jack. Mm. No, on the left, the pencils. Is that's Jack. not Jack. That's not my lettering. Uh, it's not my inking. Uh, the battle axe is not Jack. It's somebody faking Jack. Uh, I think Jack uh, added the crackle from the flamethrower. And of course, DC added the little box there with the flamethrower lettering on it. Um, in my opinion, <laughs> I think they made it a much weaker cover yeah. because to me, uh, with the exception of the crackle, which I think is a nice addition, um, I just don't, I don't care for it mm. because it looks like a patch of job. Well, that's what it is. <laughs> so what do we got up next? Mr. Miracle for me was a fun book, you know, and uh, in fact, um, since Jim Serenko was proud of the fact that he kind of inspired Jack for Mr. Miracle, because in his early career, Jim was a magician, an excellent magician, billed as the young Houdini. Uh, I had, in those days, Thermofax copies that uh, if he was smart, he would have copied them on, uh, with xerography, but I sent the Thermofax copies of the complete inked book uh, I gave to Jim Starenko way back then. And you can see basically how Jack pretty much penciled it. And I gave it a Bill Drought uh, yeah. and some of the other guys that did good gals. And Jack was right. Don't change the faces, Mike, because it's not, it's not Jack anymore. But you will notice there's no border on most of that page. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one time that Jack actually put a little more, thought's the wrong word, a little more effort into um, his rough penciled um, scripting and designed that box, which I tried to fill it the best I could, as uh, he intended. When, when he went back to Marvel, <clears throat> and same old story, it took him till the fifth issue of his stuff he was doing for them to acquiesce to his desire to have me. Uh, when I would ever leave panels with no borders and meant it to be white, they would slip in uh, color to form a box. Yeah, right. And I always did that so they would be like a poster that pops off the page. You know, 
Yep. And I can't remember when they color this that they left all that background white because then she really pops off. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, what was it? That in those days, a Thermofax copy of her face that he just cut out and stuck down over what I had done. Mm -hmm. So those were the two things he didn't like. Uh, yeah. And this is an excellent rendering of No Moon Night. And on this page, you you added a lot of background. You liked it was originally mainly white, but you added the geometric shapes in the background. Wonderful titling, beautiful stuff. Well, I I don't know if I had to think much about it. I just I did it. Mm -hmm. You know, getting a twenty-two page book, lettering the whole thing in two days, ruling borders, circling balloons, yeah. and the display lettering, and then inking the whole book at three a day. Um, but it was my job, and I had wanted for years to ink Jack's comic books. And so when it happened, I wanted to make sure it was the best, the best effort I could bring to it. Oh, hell, I could have inked it. And I mean, you know, I have great respect for Joe Sinnott. Joe Sinnott is probably my favorite inker. You know, um, and the big difference between Joe Sennett and Mike Royer is that Joe Sennett inked Jack Kirby MGM. <laughs> I inked Jack Kirby Warner Brothers. And if you understand the dichotomy of the motion picture industry during its golden age and the amount of prestige and money that different studios lavished on their products, Jack was Warner Brothers. He grew up on the Warner Brothers programmers, and there was just enough on the screen to sell the story. And I'm kind of trying to come up with some of that whole cloth. But like if it's a hotel lobby, there might be three people in it. In MGM, there'd be 36 people and a staff of people all over the hotel, um, which didn't necessarily make the story any better, but you knew it was friggin' MGM. <laughs> and Joe Sinnott added so much beauty and slick to Jack that the only objection I find is that it's not pure Jack anymore. But there are two sides to, you know, one's preference for who they want to see. Uh, Jack never, well, his deal was he kept the original art. But now and then he would give me a couple of pages which I then promptly gave away to friends because I didn't want to collect me. I wanted a page inked by Gia Coya. Right. I, wanted, I wanted a page inked by Joe Sennett, you know. Um, and now, of course, 40, 50 years later, I continually am metaphorically kicking myself in the butt because I should have kept those things. But then again, Alex Tulse once said, don't ever give anything to Mike Royer. He'll wind up selling it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> or, or trading it. <laughs> well, I once had a huge collection of original comic strip art. And then I fell in love with collecting 16 millimeter movies. Mm. I amassed a wonderful collection by selling and trading my original art. You know. Right. Um, so a six and one half does another. I've never been uh, prosperous enough, or or knew how to play the stock market. That things that I loved sometimes were sacrificed for something that I was loving more at the time that I made the sacrifices. Yeah. But at my advanced years, I can't take any of that with me. Uh, what would my wife do with it? other than she would have a list of the dealers not to talk to <laughs> right. that are listed in my uh, Rolodex under vultures. <laughs> so this is, um, this is the cover to Mr. Miracle number six. I don't see anything on my screen. And I don't even see, I don't even, there we go. All right. This is one of those things that I recently did a recreation of this 
And I have just as much a problem recreating Oberon up there on the cliff as inking it on the original, which was 10 by 15, because it was basically just Jack's impression of Orion holding or uh, Oberon holding onto the rocks. Yeah, here, here's the here's the pencils. Part of the pencil disappeared there, but uh, yeah, no, it, it, the copy wasn't good. But it, it only has the top part. Okay. So you can see Oberon is just like really vaguely there, his face and everything. Well, yeah, and if you blow that up, it's um, sometimes there's a thing like that, that little drawing of, of Oberon, especially when you've got art that's 10 by 15. Um, it reads better in pencil than when you ink it. Because there's a tendency, even though you're not changing Jack, you're trying to make it a little richer, finish the statement. Mm -hmm. And... In my opinion now, that's one statement that I should not have finished. I should have just traced it. Hmm. And then now we have uh, Funky Flashman. Oh, yeah. This is a... I love that. <laughs> I, I love this working on this book. Just loved it. Did you laugh a lot? Uh, I just thought it was a hoot. Uh, it was a hoot because it was so damn true. <laughs> Uh, there are some people that think it's vicious and overdone. Well, I'm not one of them. Nice title. I, uh, well, hell, I can't remember any book of Jack's that wasn't fun. Uh, sometimes I had to wait until it was published to uh, thoroughly enjoy it because I was working so fast and furiously. But, uh, this is this is an unused cover to um, Mr. Miracle number seven. I just thought it was really nice, so I included it. I like it much more than the actual published version. How did it look when I inked it? This is inked. Did I ruin it? No, it looks great. I, we don't have the pencils to this. I'm in, the, I'm in the process of negotiating doing a recreation of Jack Kirby's Black Panther issue number one. Oh, wow. And I have a really nice high-res copy of the printed book. And I have a really nice high-res copy of the pencils. And I'm going to ask the client if he wouldn't mind if I, rather than laboriously reproduced the original cover, if I re-inked it now as opposed to then mm -hmm. you'll probably say forget it pal but i'm gonna ask <laughs> i like those big pages you know they really didn't go any faster in, in right. inking them because right. even if jack filled the page with one face it was one hell of a detailed face this is really and, detailed uh, I, uh, whenever I could, I would do as many open blacks as possible. And it turns out by, uh, reading a recent thread of, uh, Eric Larson's on one of the Kirby groups, uh, he called my open blacks adding more interest to a page. Yeah, true. And maybe that's what it was. I mean, there were some blacks I looked at them and I knew this should be solid. And I was looking at it and I said, this can't be solid. This is, oh, another great, another great spread. And to ink dark side so that he looked like carved out of stone or something. Yep. Uh, Statue. Those kind of things were fun to do. Yeah. Now, actually... I didn't mind lettering these double page spreads because it's got a lot less lettering. Hmm. Hmm. You know, this, this was a fun page. I really wish that Jack had been able to do a big Barta and her, uh, what were they called? Um, furies. Female furies. Female. They, um, that would have been just cool. Yeah. 
But then again, uh, I like Jack's women. Uh, the most fun I ever had in Jack's women was on uh, Flash Galaxy Green. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> What can I say? What can I say? And this one these, these, ask, these kind of splashes are interesting. Ask your question. Tell me to shut up and just listen. No, my question is you can see the pattern on the ground, like the it looks like the grass pattern. Did you add do you you probably don't remember, but do you think that's something that you would have added or was that roughly there? No, in I, I I I wouldn't have added it. Um and I think that's a case of where he may have delineated more of the grass. Mm -hmm. It might have been more like the grass that's at the roots of the tree at the bottom right. Yep. But I uh, made it more solid because I felt it popped the characters off the page more. Well, it actually unites all the characters. It's really cool the way it, the way it works. It's, it like brings your eye through the whole layout. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> who pointed out recently that if that, uh, the, the back two thirds of that truck must have been balsa wood for her to hold it where she is <laughs> and hold it so steady? Yeah, but mm -hmm. if any, if anybody's looking at that and questioning it, they're not paying attention to what Jack's point was exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I got a kick out of, uh, Inking uh, Shiloh's hair. You can see you can you can see the places where I've left the white spaces and the black. Yeah. Um. You know the kid definitely uh, does not have um, the typical hair you would think that he would have. Right. Uh, it's it's awfully full and wavy, but. Um, it's Jack. Jack is creating these characters. So like if you look at the cover of Dingbats of Danger Street, the goofy kid with the glasses is me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, but hopefully I don't really look like that, or did I look like it all those years ago? You know? Wasn't Mr. Miracle based on uh, Burt Reynolds? I mean, here uh, it looks a lot like him. Did you ever hear that? I, yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I know the character himself was inspired by Jim Steranko, the young Houdini. But um, actually, I look at that, and at the time in working on it, I would have made no connection to anybody uh, in the entertainment biz. It's just it's Jack, and uh, you know, don't screw it up, Mike. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oops. Ah, the famous Mr. Miracle cover that for some reason. Uh, What's interesting is Dark Side um, has his fist up, and then they whited it all out. And then they added that white silhouette around the edges. Well, oh, there we go. Look at that damn halo around the characters. I, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, how did I ink it before they altered it? I wouldn't have left that. Hey, well, you don't have my inks, no, but no. Um, the way Jack drew it, the guy in the back there uh, behind Light Ray's hand, uh, yeah. he would have had the top of his hair would have been just the curve of his uh, hairline, and the only feathering of black would be where it, it touches his forehead. Right. Otherwise, right. there's absolutely no reason on God's green earth. <laughs> you know, and, and, and if I, if, if, if it, if I inked it the way he penciled it, uh, I would not of course left all those open blacks there because many of them, if I were inking it, I would have done the strokes to work more with the shapes of rock. But when Jack was quickly doing black areas, um, sometimes it worked to leave open blacks. Uh, and sometimes it didn't because uh, the strokes he made were made in the interest of expediency. See, the one thing that Jack did 
Uh, Russ Manning did it too. And I see so many of uh, artists, when they post their work on Facebook, when they had blacks, they always filled them with carbon. I hate seeing artists who draw stuff and every place they want blacks got an X in it. Because yeah. how do they know that it's really going to work when right. it's inked? Yes. When Jack did that, he was in control and he knew it would work. And if it didn't work, he would change it. Yeah. And so that's always kind of bugged me. And some artists who I have great respect for, when I see their pencils, it's like all these areas with the little X's in them. Which issue is this? It's the last issue. It's 18. It's where they get married on, on this page. Barda and, and Mr. Miracle get married. And the great turbulence must be the consummation, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's dark side arriving. <laughs> oh, oh. So all the lightning bolts in the bottom left-hand corner is not satisfaction. Okay. Now oh, here's a case where they... This is where they had Neil Adams redo what Jack had drawn. So this is what you drew. I, this is what you inked. And then that's your inks right on top of it. Yeah. And then this is what Neil Adams and production did. They made the vampire much larger. And then Neil Adams drew the Superman figure and changed the background. Yeah. Well... Does mother know best, really? <laughs> yeah. um, it's a it's a it's a nice cover, but there's something about Superman. Neil Adams Superman looks kind of surprised and and intimidated. Yeah. Uh, the original Superman is, you know, here I come to save the day. And that's mm -hmm. right. Right. Let's send the, let's send this guy back to the coffin he belongs in. You know, <laughs> see one of the problems with these covers, which I've never understood. I guess it all has to do with protecting trademarks worldwide. But the Superman's pal, the new Jimmy Olsen, I'm Olsen. For my money, that lettering sucks. Oh yeah. Uh, just because the the. Swiftly passing by Superman is is done that way. Does it mean you can't letter Superman in any other alphabet? <laughs> right. And the new Jimmy Olsen. Now, if Jack had laid these things out as a splash page, I would have done the lettering so that it worked with the artwork. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they took off the Read the Man from Transylvania. You know, and then they the added it to vampire, vampire. Like, you've, like you've never seen it before <laughs> or since. And then a lot of these issues, especially Jimmy Olsen, had backup stories. This is just one of them with Aaron. Yeah, half of the backup stories, I think, in the fourth world books were, were inked by uh, uh, Vince Coletta, <laughs> and then the others, I actually got to ink them. And uh, You know, sometimes if the muse was with me on page two, bottom left, I could do all those speed lines with a brush. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> uh, if the muse wasn't with me, I had a triangle with raised with pennies, and I would take one of my uh, Gelat pen points right. and just start outside the border and lean on it and pull it through to a point. Yeah. And then I would either take a razor blade and peel off. Uh, that looks like it was done with whiteout. That's, that's, I didn't put any whiteout on it. So obviously DC w wanted it done that way at the bottom because I would have just taken, I would have taken a razor blade, lightly scored it and then peeled it off, burnished it down with the, you know, with a piece of paper and my, and my, the finger grips on a scissor, just burnished it down. And, uh, you know, before we are finished today, do I get a chance to hold up the, um, the phantom presentation piece that Jack Kirby did for the animation business in the 1980s? Sure. 
Uh, yes. There we go. Now, this is something I believe that you reconstructed. And let me tell you, when I saw this page, my gut feeling was that has got to be white lettering on a solid black background. <laughs> uh, of course, the only, where, only place I could get it done is uh, the library in Norwalk, which was next to Whittier where I lived, had a copy machine that did everything in negative. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I took the page with the lettering down there and copied it and then cut it out and pasted it down. And um, same thing with the Jimmy Olsen. And to save this page for poster posterity, or, anyway, you know what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. is to save this page for generations in the future to observe, um, Tom, bless his heart, um, somehow redid that so that it will be there now forever because the library Thermofax copy was turning a rich golden brown. brown. Yeah, yeah, I had it. Um, this is when you still could get real photo stats. So this is a real photo stat replacement. Uh -huh. And I kept the original, of course. I mean, but it's so brown that you could barely see it. I mean, in hindsight, I wish I would have stained it or made it a little bit closer to the color. But back then... You know, I wasn't doing that kind of stuff. So, but I this, it, it, this was a, this was a fun page, and this might have been finally at the period where I believe I phoned DC and um, told them if they wanted alterations done to Superman's face and Jimmy Olsen's, would they please send me the model sheets they wanted followed, and I would make those minor changes so that when the book is printed. The inking all came from one hand. Right. So right. I don't remember so, now whether that was only one or two issues that I got to do that. But So uh, here's it. I think it's only one. This is issue. So on the right-hand side is the same issue. These are the pencils, and these are the inks that you added of, of Superman's face. So they look much closer to what Jack intended. Boy, I, I, I look at these things all these years later, and... I didn't just trace his pencils. I don't know. <laughs> you did not. <laughs> These pencils mm -hmm. are excellent for a guy with the talent of a Barry Windsor Smith or some of these people that have their own distinctive style. They could have completed this. Um, but in my head, it had to look like Jack. So that's all I got. So you want to show your phantom. And also, of course, Mike does wonderful recreations. And he has a website where you and you can find him on Facebook. Um, yeah, just 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 find me on Facebook because um, I haven't updated that uh, website in uh, a long time. Just stop sharing your screen. So well, like I'm going to hold this page up. But since. Uh, oh, OK. Yeah. Are you able to pick pick me up with the. Yeah, hang on. This was a fun piece and a challenge because Jack did this very late in his career. And the client, I told him, I said, do you mind if I add Jack back into this? Because if you look at the original uh, piece, which was re reprinted years ago in the Kirby Collector, you can see that they took an eraser to most of the figure work on the Phantom and took Jack out of it. Anyway, this is a little warp if you can you look at yeah. those figures and that it's it's now Kirby, the best I could I could do. Yeah. Tomorrow I will do the narrative lettering. Oh. And uh, then I'll clean it up and send it off to the client. And my payment will arrive shortly. The first half of my payment was 42 pounds. <laughs> I did this for one of the premier phantom collectors in the country, Anthony Tolan. And I I wrote him out of the blue once and said, hey, have you ever considered trading any of those wonderful shadow pulp reprints for artwork? And he said, let's do it. So I'll have enough to read for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that so was we're really great. Are you going to be able to edit this into something coherent? I think we will. Yeah. I mean, we, we we've got uh, we've got nine people watching us while this has been going on. We have a few a few questions in the chat room. So um, somebody's well, a, you 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 guys, I'm sure, have the ability to do some post production editing. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I will rely on you to uh, make you look good. Do your magic. It, it'd probably look better if you block my section of the screen out. <laughs> but, uh, or I should I should alter the. Uh, look at that cool fan up there. <laughs> By golly. Uh, here I am in the lap of luxury. Yeah. And a squeaky chair with bookcases full of movies and TV shows and DVD. And so far, 50 audio CD readings of The Spider. Thank you, guys. All right. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And don't forget to support the Kirby Museum. Donations. <laughs> become a member. 50th anniversary of the Fourth World Books, everybody. Go out and buy all the reprints if you don't have them. Sit down and reread this stuff. You will find out that the stuff that you read when you were kids is so much deeper now that you are an adult. You are correct. Words of wisdom. Listen to the man. Codger in Medford, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Or as one of my favorite DJs used to say, clean thoughts on a dirty wall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to send you away. All right. Okay. Bye, Bye Mike. Guys. Thanks, Mike. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And keep an eye on our social media feeds because we've got more of these coming. We love doing them. And there's a whole summer of the fourth world ahead of us. With Not even summer yet. And we're <laughs> talking about calling it summer. So, like, right. you know, we did episode zero last week. We had special edition Mike Royer. Um, so we'll be uh, we'll be picking up with um, what are we going to be picking up with, Jimmy Olsen? <laughs> first, first few issues of Jimmy Olsen. Or are we gonna are we gonna do it as Jack drew it, which would be first issues of New Gods Forever People, uh, Mister Miracle, and then go to Jimmy Olsen, or do we do off of the drawing board or on the newsstand? <laughs> You'll find out, folks. Because <laughs> we'll do it. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Um, once again, and uh, you know, look at the look, well. Don't look at look at that cool T-shirt Tom has on. You can buy one of those on our website. You can't buy this one, unfortunately. Um, anyhow, all right, thanks a lot, folks. Thank you.